Could be sitting back there. Co chairman, so he'll, he'll help out this morning with, uh, in this program. Uh, Martin Fleischman thought this was at 9 o'clock, so he just barely arrived. Uh, it was 9 o'clock originally, but the talk is, is, is really scheduled now for 8.30. So uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to have Martin Fleischman here. Ten years ago, Martin Fleischman, the Stan Ponds, announced the, the, the co-fusion they'd worked on a number of years before. So uh, last March was the 10th anniversary, 10 years since this, uh, since this subject developed. Now, whether you want to call it co-fusion or something else, that's uh, up to different people. I like to call it the fleischman Ponds effect. That's the name I like to apply to it. That's good. And you don't get in trouble with that. <laughs> but anyway, it's my honor You're to... You're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know you can't even file a patent in the U.S. Patent Office that has the word cold fusion in it? Yeah, right, yeah. What did I do here? Good. Uh, got 12 patents. But, but Martin Fleischman has won many honors. One I think that I'm impressed by in the Electrochemical Society is one of the top awards is the Plating Medal Award in the, in the Electrochemical Society. And in this talk this morning is co-fusion, past, present, and future. Well, I must tell you first of all that the Palladium Medal is still intact. We did at one stage think we'd do a big experiment on it, but then decided against it. Well, I think uh, you'll see that uh, the other speakers will tell you quite a lot about what is going on, and I've got this vast, sweeping title. But I'm actually going to take a very narrow focus, because there's only time to take a narrow focus, and I probably won't have time to do all the, to tell you about all the uh, parts which I should tell you about. Now, uh, I, I said cold fusion past, present, and future, because I think it is quite interesting to see why, we, why I didn't do it, why we didn't do it for such a long time. What was behind that and how, with the evolution of time, it became clear that there was perhaps an effect there and that there was some sense in studying it. Because really, this phenomenon is part of a much, much wider group of phenomena. And people have looked at it in a very blinkered way, and I think cold fusion, which I hate this word, these two words. This is a standalone topic. It isn't. It's, it's part of a much wider topic. Well, for me, the whole thing starts, so uh, I know a historical perspective is not supposed to be a good idea, but I will use a historical perspective. Uh, for me, the whole thing starts with a paper which I found in 19, at the end of 1947. I'm a very old man. Uh, a brilliant experiment by Alfred Kuhn in the University of Göttingen, who took a very thin palladium wire and loaded the wire down here, electrolytically down here, and then applied the potential plus and minus to this wire, and measured then at different times the times of arrival of the diffusion wave at the different zigzags down the wire. Now, if it was purely diffusion, of course, you'd get a diffusion-controlled wave running this way and that way. But if, uh, and this was the proton, because deuterium hadn't been discovered at that time yet. But if it is charged, then, of course, it will go faster to the negative end and slower to the positive end. And this in, is indeed, and this, this experiment is actually very important as regards the future of uh, uh, cold fusion. And what he found in fact was precisely this, that if this is the line for diffusion, then uh, the uh, protons moved faster to the negative end and slower to the positive end. And if the polarity was reversed, mm -hmm. then you could make them go back uh, uh, to the negative end. And these go to the, uh, back, back to the positive end and these to the negative. Now, this was an extremely uncomfortable experiment, because what it showed, incidentally, <coughs> the uh, mobility of the protons fit the Nernst Einstein equation, which you can get from this. So there were bare, the hydrogen in the lattice exists as bare protons. This subject matter became totally confused later. This, this was just suppressed. People didn't think about this for about 20, 30 years, because it was such an uncomfortable result. And subsequently, it has been uh, more work was done, which is quite wrong. 
we can discuss this if you wish. Now, why is this so uncomfortable? The easiest way to see this is to do a born harbor cycle on the hydrogen going into the lattice. And what we see, in fact, that the uh, absorption of hydrogen in the lattice is exothermic. And in fact, the salvation energy of the ions in the lattice is enormous. It's about of the order of 12 dB. <coughs> so the, I the ions are extremely strongly bound in the lattice. And that alone tells you that you can really only interpret this experiment if hydrogen is part of a very large quantum system so that it can be unharmonically excited. I should have realized that at that time, but I didn't. Uh, and in fact, uh, setting down the usual way you would talk about it at that time about the quantum mechanics of ions in that this is or anything else for that matter, uh, we would see this oscillatory potential energy curve. And of course, you could not apply, uh, obtain a sufficient change in the potential energy to compensate for the nuclear repulsion, except under uh, very, uh, you might, in fact, get some nuclear reaction under very extreme conditions. And extreme conditions I was thinking about there now would now be described as inertial confinement. But I was not aware whether inertial confinement had been discovered at that time. I still don't know. But this is what I was thinking about. And that was obviously impossible in the university in Canada to carry that out. Now, so I left this whole thing alone. And then in the mid-1960s, I came to realize that we really have to discuss the behavior of condensed matter in terms of quantum electrical dynamics, not in terms of classical mechanics, and not in terms of quantum mechanics, but in terms of quantum electrical dynamics. Now, this is an illustration. I didn't arrive at this conclusion this particular way. This is simply an illustration of the fact. And here's our, our good old friend in the Bible theory, which calculates the self-energy of this ion in an ionic atmosphere, which is static. We have a static classical model of uh, ions in solution. But of course, we know that that is wrong, that it is not so. In fact, there was a lecture here which I couldn't go to on Brownian motion. And it has been known for a long time that ions, well, Einstein did this way back, beginning of the century, that ions move by Brown Brownian motion, the motion of ions in solution by Brownian motion. And we also know from the 19th century, the work of Kohlrausch, that they move independently of each other at infinite dilution. That all sounds all right until you say, well, what about Maxwell's equation? They accelerate and decelerate. They have these addicts accelerating and decelerating. <coughs> so they have to radiate. So the only point at which the Debye theory can be true is at absolute zero. It's an absolute zero theory. At any finite temperature, it is not acceptable. We accept it, but it's not acceptable. And in fact, you have to discuss the behavior of ions in solution and everything else for that matter in terms of quantum electrodynamics. The motion is rigorously quantized. There is no <coughs> classical motion of ions in solution. It's all quantized. I still didn't do anything about it. But we did start work on thinking about uh, uh, the, uh, thinking about the general problem of how we could get a handle on uh, quantum electrodynamics. Really, I should say this, uh, you know, the interpretation based on this type of model is kinematic. The dynamic, the consequences of thinking about dynamics remain hidden. Now, I mean, you can say, well, why should we bother about thinking about dynamics? We are perfectly happy with kinematics. Well, that's all right, but you know, science moves on, and you come to a new frontier, and you have to say, I do want to understand the dynamic properties of species in liquid 